In this video, we're going to take a look at hypothesis testing for two means, and we are going to be working with independent samples. If you have not watched the other videos about the basics of hypothesis testing, you will want to go back and watch those videos first before you jump into this one. Now, before we get started, we first need to look at what does it mean to have an independent sample versus a dependent sample. Well, independent samples means that our two groups that we are looking at, our two populations, are not related to each other in any way, shape, or form. Okay, a dependent sample means that they have some underlying connection. So oftentimes, people will look at like the heights of men compared to women. That would be independent sampling. But if we changed that to the heights of husbands compared to their wives, that would be considered dependent sampling because there is a natural connection between husbands and wives. If you have like pretest and post tests of the same students, that would be dependent sampling because it is the same students from one sample, the pretest, compared to their next sample, the post test. Sometimes it's not quite as obvious. Um, it could possibly be like the presidential candidates and their opponents. That would be considered a dependent sample because they are actually connected to each other because they are running during the same election year. They are, they are paired together. Okay, so what we're going to be looking at is only situations when we have independent samples for this video. Now with that, we are going to have three different situations. The first one we're going to look at is when we do not know the population standard deviation for either of our samples, sample one or sample two, and we are going to assume that those standard deviations are not equal to each other. So when that happens, we have some requirements here. So this um, standard deviation from the first population, standard deviation from the second population are unknown, not equal. The samples have to be independent and they need to be simple random samples. And then both samples are large, so each sample either needs to be larger than 30, so we can use the central limit theorem, or both samples are from a normally distributed population. So our null hypothesis, it can actually take two forms. The more common form is when we have our null hypothesis and we have the mean of our first sample is equal to the mean of our second sample. Now, an alternative way that you might see this written is that the mean of the first sample minus the mean of the second sample is equal to zero. And these are equivalent expressions because if our two values are assumed to be equal, when I subtract them, I would end up with a zero. So both of these are equivalent expressions. We are typically going to be using this one. Now, our, our, our alternative hypothesis can take the three different forms that we've had with all of our hypothesis testing. It could be that the population means are not equal to each other. It could be that the population mean of our first sample is less than the population mean of our second one. Or it could be that the population mean of our first one is larger than the population mean of our second one. Now, each of these could also be written in a form like this where we would do mean sub one minus mean sub two is not equal to zero. We could do where the mean sub one minus the mean sub two is less than zero, or mean sub one minus mean sub two is greater than zero. So these are all equivalent ways to write these. Now, once we get our um, requirements checked off and we have the type of test we need to do, and we know our null and our alternative hypothesis, that would bring us to our test statistic. Now, in our test statistic here, we have a lot of different notation. These X bars, those stand for the sample means. Now the subscript here, the one just means it's the sample mean of our first sample, and the two would be the sample mean of our second sample. Now on this part right here, mu sub one minus mu sub two, well, if we go back and look at what we just had written down here, if our means are equal to each other, mu sub one minus mu sub two should be equal to a zero. So in our um, test statistic here, this portion right here is typically gonna turn out to be a zero. Now these bottom portions, the S represents our sample standard deviation, but notice it's S squared. So that's really our variance. 
and then for sample one, same thing here, we would have our variance for sample two. Now the variance is the standard deviation squared. So if the problem gives you the standard deviation, you would pop that in here and square it. Um, if it gives you the variance, then you would just use the number directly. You wouldn't square it then. And then our n sub 1 and our n sub 2 are just our sample size. When you um, look up your t value in the uh, standardized table, you're going to use degrees of freedom, whichever is the smaller of n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1. So basically, whichever sample size is smaller, subtract one, and that's the degrees of freedom that you would use for your, um, for your particular problem. Once you get to that point, then you would have to choose the critical value method or the p-value method to um, complete your hypothesis test. So here's going to be our example. A researcher wanted to see if there was a difference in the high school GPAs of students from low socio socioeconomic status, SES, and high SES. He gathered the GPAs of 85 students from low SES and found their mean GPA to be 2.07 and the standard deviation to be 0.81. He gathered GPAs of 107 students from high SES and found their mean GPA to be 2.58 and the standard deviation to be 0.73. Assume that the population variances are not equal and perform a hypothesis test at the 0.05 significance level. Now, first thing we need to do is decide what type of test we're going to do. Well, it told us up here that we want to compare their high school GPAs to each other. So we are going to be comparing two means. Now, these would be independent samples because there's no indication in here that our students that they were sampling from are related. The other key is that in order to have dependent samples, our sample size has to be equal because each, um, each uh, data point in your sample would have to have a partner. Well, in this one, we had 85 students from low SES and 107, so it wouldn't even be possible to pair them up one-to-one. -one. So that's another hint that it is an independent sample. Now, we would need to check our requirements off. So we, um, we do not know the population standard deviations. It wasn't given to us. It tells us to assume that they're not equal to each other. Okay, and then we have to assume that we are going to have a simple random sample here. And then we don't necessarily know anything about the shape of the distribution, but since our sample sizes were each larger than 30, we can go ahead and apply the central limit theorem and go ahead and um, proceed with our uh, hypothesis test. So we want to then go and write our null and our alternative hypothesis. So my null hypothesis would be that the mean of the first group is equal to the mean of the second group. And then our alternative hypothesis, well, as we read through here, there's no indication as to whether it wants us to find if one group is higher or lower than the other group. It just wants us to see if there is a difference. So then we would go with the not equal symbol. So there's our null, there's our low or alternative hypothesis. We are going to need to decide which one is group one and which one is group two. So I am just going to go off of the order they appeared in the problem. So we are going to do low SES is group one. And I'm going to make a list of all the different values that I know, and I'm going to put it into notation. So when I get to that test statistic formula, I can just plug the numbers in, and then it becomes a simple calculator exercise. So from our problem, it said that he gathered 85 students from low SES. So that's our sample size. That would be N. And he found the mean. So our sample mean for group 1 is 2.07. And the standard deviation for that group was 0.81. So our sample standard deviation for group one is 0.81. I'm going to go ahead and then put the high SES here as my group two. Okay. And my sample size for group two was 107. My sample mean for group two was 
and the standard deviation for group 2 is 0 0.73. And we're going to use a significance level of 0 0.05. So I'm just going to write that down over here, that my alpha is 0 0.05. Now I'm going to go ahead and do my computation for my test statistic. So I would have t is equal to, well, it says I have to take my um, x sub 1 minus x sub 2. So I would have 2.07 minus 2.58. And then we already talked about how mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 0. I'm going to divide that by the square root of 0.81. So my standard deviation of my first group squared divided by the sample size plus the standard deviation of my second group squared divided by its sample size. Okay, once you get to this point, um, you will need to do that entire computation and you should come out with a t value of negative 4.526-ish. Um, that is a rounded value there. Okay, so this right here is our test statistic. Now our degrees of freedom in this case, we would take our smaller sample size, so 85 minus 1, and my degrees of freedom are going to be 84 for this particular problem. Now at this particular point is when you would need to go on and choose whether you're going to do the p-value method or the critical value method, which I'm not going to go through um, in this particular video because I've done it multiple times in the other videos with basics of hypothesis testing and the uh, sampling with proportions and sampling with single means. Okay, so that was our kind of our first situation. Now with our second situation, sig, uh, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are still unknown, so we don't know our population standard deviations or our variances, but this time we are going to assume that they are equal to each other. And this is often referred to as pooled variances. Now as far as the hypothesis test goes, the only thing that really changed as far as the requirements go is that now we're going to assume them to be equal. Everything else is still the same. Our test statistic though is going to be different. Okay. It still has the same general setup where I still have my sample means being subtracted here. My population means subtracted is still a zero. But notice right here, instead of my variance of sample one and my variance of sample two, I have now my pooled variance. That's what the P stands for here. And we have a second computation that we have to do where in order to find the value that goes here, we have to do this computation right there. So let's pretend that our last example said that we want to assume that they are equal. Well, I still have all my same, um, same values from before as far as like my, my N1 is equal to 85 and my N2 is 107 and all that. But I just want to show you how you would do this computation. So my pooled variances for that problem, I would take my 85 minus 1 and then it says take my variance from sample 1, or think of this as your standard deviation squared from sampled 1, which I have to go back and look at what that was, 0.81, and make sure we squared it because that was a, st a standard deviation in our problem, plus I have to take my sample size from my second one, which was 107 minus 1, and I need to take it times the variance, or the standard deviation squared, of that second sample, which was 0.73 Oops, squared. I'm going to take all that divided by sample size of group 1 minus 1 plus sample size of group 2 minus 1. When you type all that into your calculator, you should get a value of approximately 
um, 7, 4. And then this will be the value that you plug in here and in here. Now when you plug them in here, you are not going to square that value because this formula already took care of that component of it. So in our denominator for this particular problem, you would just have the square root of 0.5874 divided by 85 plus 0.5874 divided by 107. Notice that they are not being squared. That's already part of our notation here. And then you would proceed um, just like before. Now our degrees of freedom for this particular case, since we pooled our variances, we would take our sample sizes and add them together. And then we're gonna subtract um, two from that. So we would end up with uh, degrees of freedom of 190 for this particular situation. So that was kind of our second situation. Now our third situation, this time we are um, we know the values for our population standard deviations. Now this is very very unlikely to occur, but if it does happen, then the only thing that really changes for this first first portion is that we know those values. But everything else after that is the same as it was in our first two situations. Our test statistic. Very similar setup to what we've seen so far, but notice this time now we have a z-score. And we still have our sample means, our population means being subtracted is still zero. But here, instead of plugging in our sample variances like we did in example one, or our pooled variances like we did in the second type, we would actually plug in our population variances. And then we would continue on like normal. Okay. Degrees of freedom for this one would be the same as for the uh, second part where we add our sample sizes together and then subtract two. Okay. Now, all of this can take a really long time to do by hand. So if you are working with StatCrunch, we can get this done very quickly. There's gonna be kind of two separate ways that we're gonna go about doing this. First of all, if our population variances are unknown, so those were the first two types that we looked at. We are going to go into stat, t stats, to sample, and then you would select with data or with summary depending on um, what you're working with. Now to distinguish between the first type and the second type, there is going to be a little box that says pool the variances. And depending on the problem, you will either check or uncheck that problem or that box. Okay, and then the other way, if our population variances are known, we would go to Z stat, Z stat. Okay, so before we were in T stat, now we would be in Z stat, still to sample um, with data or with summary depending. So let's go take a look at what that will look like. All right, so we're here in stat crunch now, and if we come to the stat menu and go to T stats, to sample with summary, it's going to prompt us with this box. So our first sample here, it wants our sample mean, which we had 2.07. It wants our sample standard deviation, which was 0 0.81. And then our sample size was 85. Now for our second sample, our sample mean was 2.58. Our sample standard deviation was 0.73 and our sample size was 107. Now right here is the box that I was talking about where if it tells us that our, we are assuming that our population standard deviations are equal to each other, then we would check the box for pool variances. Um, we are gonna assume that they are not equal to each other, so we are going to leave that unchecked. Now notice right here, it has the null hypothesis written in the form of a subtraction problem. So we're going to leave that set equal to zero. And then we wanna make sure that our symbol here for our alternative hypothesis matches the alternative hypothesis that we had. So we want the not equal. From there, we will press compute. And you can see that our test statistic is negative 4.52566. So very, very similar to what we got. And then it gives us our p-value right here if we're doing the p-value method to use that. 
Now, the reason our test statistic would be slightly different, again, would be because we would have to do some rounding when we're doing our computations, and the computer program has to do less rounding. So this one would probably be more accurate. Now, if you are going to do the third situation, you would come to stat, Z stats, two sample, and then for us with summary. So last time we went to T stat because we were doing um, a T test. If we know the population standard deviations, we would do a Z test, two sample with summary. Now notice though it still asks us for the same type of information, so we would add all that information in there just like we did before, leave our null equal to zero, select our appropriate um, symbol here for our alternative, and then press compute. So the information we enter is still the same, but it's a matter of which menu do you go to. Okay, And then once you get to that, you would probably use the p-value method where you compare your p-value to the significance level to decide whether or not you're going to reject the null hypothesis.